Welcome to Ladakh. It is a land of mountains, of monks and monasteries. Uh, the word La means uh, passage, passes, mountain passes. And it has also been sometimes said to be a desert in the sky. So uh, La is just a mountain pass. So Ladakh is a land of passes. Now, I have never heard of the word Ladakh until I went over to Bangkok one day for a function. And uh, one monk that I met told me that, you know, we have students in Ladakh who sings your songs because I write songs. And I didn't know where Ladakh was. And when he says that it was the Himalayas, I was really amazed. And that monk was Venerable Nagasena, who happens to be the nephew of uh, Venerable Sangasena. Okay, now, uh, in Ladakh, uh, it is actually located on the northwestern part of India. You see, Leh, which is the capital of Ladakh, is just north of uh, Delhi. And the journey, the flight is about uh, one hour, uh, 20 minutes. And uh, Ladakh uh, falls onto the leeward side of the Himalayan, so it doesn't receive very much rain. Uh, the uh, Himalayans are in the south, in the north will be Karakoram, and it leads to Pakistan. Right? Uh, Ladakh also shares uh, boundaries with China, and you know that recently there has been some um, border disputes between China and India, and we hope that the issue will be resolved. Uh, this is called the line of actual control. So it is this part. The Aksai Tin is a disputed border area claimed by India but administered by China. So they still have not resolved uh, these border issues. The other part that uh, which uh, creates some kind of issues with India and China is Anurachal Pradesh and that is on the, the eastern side. I hope that these uh, border issues will be resolved very quickly just as uh, China and Russia have already resolved their border issues so that doesn't become an issue these days. Now let us go on to the mountains first. One of the most amazing thing, if you get onto the flight from uh, Delhi to Leh, and uh, we like to get our, start, uh, our flight early in the morning, you will actually begin to fly over the Himalayans. And so uh, this is the scenery that you see, the glaciers on the, on the mountain peaks. Isn't that amazing? And of course, um, uh, one of the other amazing things is that when you descend in, in Leh, uh, Leh, uh, the, the airport itself is surrounded by, by, by mountains. So it is actually like descending, as you descend on the airport, it is like the plane have to go in circles in this, to fly into a bowl. So you see the mountains just be in front of you, but then the plane goes just around. So it is actually quite amazing. Uh, okay, here, our host is Venerable Sangasena, and you know that he's wearing the robes. Uh, as uh, Didi Juse mentioned, he was a soldier before he became a monk. So he joined the Indian army at the age of 17, uh, but he uh, left the army to become a monk because of the spiritual calling. So he has left behind his weapons and instead have gone for compassion. He established what we call the Buddhist, uh, the Mahabodhi International Meditation Center in Leh which is the capital of uh, Ladakh. But for uh, simplicity, let us use the word MIMC. That means Mahabodhi International Meditation Center. Now this place, MIMC, is equipped with facilities to accommodate international guests. And uh, because the air is much thinner, you're actually in the Himalayas, and the air, since the air is thinner, you really need to like come down when you come over to, when you land up in Ladakh. Uh, maybe one or two days really, uh, you know, take it slow, uh, move very slowly, tend to take a lot of time uh, sleeping. Uh, you don't even take a bath, don't even wash your hair <laughs> because that will sometimes cause uh, mountain sickness. All right. So the lady in front that you see, her name is Datin Sri King Min Yue. She's very talented in the arts and uh, she's actually in the 70s. So when she said that she wanted to go over to MIMC to Ladakh, her children was, were terrified with the idea. They thought there's something terrible going to happen to her. And, uh, but she still persisted and she came over to Ladakh and was returned back, uh, you know, uh, nothing, uh, you know, uh, uh, nothing went wrong. Yeah? Because sometimes people think that in the mountains, strange things might happen to you. Now I showed this picture because these are the two boys from MIMC who came here to receive us. It was a delegation from MIMC to help us when we arrived at the airport. 
Now, when we say that Ladakh is in India, maybe you have an idea of, you have some idea of how an Indian should look like. And these two phrases do not strike you as very Indian looking, but actually uh, they are Indians. And uh, in terms of genetic makeup, they have uh, the Burmese uh, uh, Tibetan, uh, you know, uh, genes. Eh? So that's how they look. And uh, when you come to Ladakh, you will actually see the more authentic part of Tibet. Because if you go to Tibet in China, you see that Tibet has actually developed a lot, a lot of new structures. And you don't really get a feeling of what you think uh, uh, Tibet should be like. Uh, and also some children down here. Uh, actually, the Tibet, the Ladakhis uh, was considered to be like hillbreeze uh, by the rest of India. Because in the 70s, they were considered to be comical, ignorant, country bumpkins. Uh, they were really poor, but they were happy because they didn't know anything better. But later on, with commercialization and all that, uh, lives, uh, you know, become too complicated. And that is when the Ladakhis begin to feel poor. Uh, Venerable Sangasena, uh, actually, after he started uh, the, uh, the center in uh, the IMIMC, he actually went out to meet up with families to encourage them to send their children to school. Many parents do not want their children to go to school, instead to help them in the farm. Uh, but those who are convinced just allowed the children to, to go over to Leh and to stay in this residential school. And of course, the lives of the children have really changed. So later on, I will just mention some of some of the success stories that you have at uh, in, in MIMC. So when you see a monastery standing uh, in this kind of barren landscape with a snow mountain at the back. This is in fact a picture of what Ladakh is all about. In India, people pray for rain. When in Ladakh, they pray for the glaciers or the snows to melt in order to provide them with drinking water and agriculture. So the melting snow from the glaciers are really quite important to them. So with this global warming and climate change, it will in fact uh, uh, affect uh, the Ladakhis if the, the, the melting of the glaciers happen too fast because they need the water for survival. You can see the landscape is really dry. Yeah. Uh, here you have a monk walking past a fluttering flax towards a choton. A choton is really a stupa and that uh, symbolizes the mind of the Buddha. And uh, it also represents a process of practice and transformation to gain enlightenment. So in Tibetan Buddhism, they call this a choton. In Sri Lanka, they call it a stupa. In Myanmar, a taitia. In China, they call it a pagoda. Here is, uh, you see this uh, uh, in the, this is Om Mani Padme Hong. So when Buddhism came to Ladakh, it came via Kashmir in the second century. So Buddhism has been in Ladakh for about uh, 2,000 years. But of course, for Tibetan Buddhism, it's about 1,000 years. And um, uh, and then uh, Kashmir itself was a flourishing center for Buddhism before it became uh, Muslim. Eh? And the words here you see as Om Mani Padme Hong is dedicated to Avalodhi Kweteshwara or Kuan Yin. And you see this everywhere, Om Mani Padme Hong. All right, uh, here um, you'll see two symbols down here. One symbol is a, 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 a drum, right? Uh, oh, oh, sorry, it's, 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 it's an it's um, umbrella. Uh, it's an umbrella. Umbrella is a sign of protection. And on the right is the vase for treasures, which represents uh, prosperity. This happens to be the rooftop of the Hermes Monastery. Uh, and uh, there are, this is the center of the Drukpa sect of Tibetan Buddhism. And I was actually attracted by the landscape at the back. Because you could see that this uh, looks like sedentary rocks and as if it has been pushed aside. And indeed, uh, Ladakh used to be at the bottom of the sea. And as a, as a result of the movement of the continental plates, it has been pushed up from the bottom of the sea. Now it becomes the Himalayans, the mountains. All right, I mentioned about the Karakoram Highway. In our journey, we have to uh, drive on mountain rocks and mountain passes. And here you can see that the rocks are black in color. Uh, that is because this is Kara Koram. Kara means black, Koram means gravel, black gravel. Uh, so sometimes we have to take mountain passes like this. 
which is really quite amazing. And of course, the height of these mountain passes where the vehicle is traveling is a few thousand feet above the top of Mount Kinabalu. <laughs> so Malaysia, we think, oh, Mount Kinabalu is so, you know, so high is our highest mountain. But uh, in Ladakh, uh, uh, Mount Kinabalu is the starting point. <laughs> and after that, you go higher. All right. And as we begin to uh, uh, go higher, and of course, the air gets thinner and the head gets lighter. And sometimes when you walk, you feel like you're giddy. You, know? you feel as if you're intoxicated and breathing becomes a labored. So every time we take a few steps, you stop, you have to stop and pan because you feel breathless after every few steps. But what amazes me was you see cyclists cycling up the mountain. Wow, <laughs> it's amazing. Because for us, even to walk is, you know, you have to put quite a bit, uh, quite a bit of effort. Um, in the Ladakh itself, there are a few passes, uh, the highest motorable pass in the world. That means a pass that you can drive through is called Kadong La. Uh, La, as you know, is, means pass. It's, it's a pass of Kadong. And uh, we have to pass through this Kadong La pass to the other side, to Nubra Valley. And that is, uh, yeah, and, and when you do that, you get a panoramic view of the Karakoram Mountains. And if you go slowly beyond that, you actually see Pakistan, all right? Now, this Kadana Pass is 18,383 feet. <laughs> so we will normally stop at Kadana Pass, uh, Kadana, uh, and uh, just for a kind of a toilet break. And when you get out of the car, you feel, oh, I'm a bit giddy already. But sometimes you have snow. So some of our participants will run and play with the snow and all that. You know? Some others, after walking to the toilet, they come back to the car and just, and just sleep because in the heat will be speeding. And the air is thin. So different people will respond to the thin air slightly differently. So at 18,000 feet, you're actually five kilometers above the sea. <laughs> and also 5,000 feet above Mount Kinabalu. Isn't that amazing? So this is the, this is the highest point that we passed uh, using a vehicle. Hmm? Uh, but the stamina of the cyclists is quite incredible. Yeah? But sometimes people who are in the mountains, when they go down lay, to lowlands, they go to the sea level, that's when they get sick. <laughs> They're not used to, to the kind of uh, air pressure that, that, that we receive. But when you go up to the mountains, uh, we, uh, we need to get adjusted. But after a few days, you get adjusted, actually. Your body will start producing hemoglobins, and you become more efficient in getting the oxygen in the air. And actually, when you come down from, uh, from Ladakh, you actually become younger. <laughs> you got much more oxygen in your body. So uh, that's the secret of youth. You go to Ladakh and you become young. <laughs> okay, so um, we also have to pass through gorges like this. Can you see? It's incredible, isn't it? It's a gorge. And uh, landslides sometimes happen in the mountains. So sometimes when you travel, your journey itself might be delayed slightly because of, uh, of a landslide. Uh, but don't worry, if you travel in the road, uh, uh, on the road in the afternoon, you wouldn't have rocks falling on you uh, because the landslide normally occur in the very early morning because of the uh, very cold temperature uh, and uh, expansion and contraction. That is when you have a landslide. Okay, so you will see sometimes the gorges are almost vertical and the river runs through the valley. Okay? This river will later join the Indus, Indus River. And you see a little bit of river down there. So this is a scenery that we don't ever see in Malaysia. It's just amazing, isn't it? I must also mention that the roads in Ladakh have been maintained by the Indian army uh, simply because of the border issues with China. So they must, they must make sure that in case of trouble, the soldiers can get to the border area as quickly as possible. So the roads are fairly well maintained. Yeah. And we have been seeing a lot of pictures of mountains, but sometimes in between the mountains, you have valleys. And when you have valleys, sometimes a straw, small river will flow to the valley, bringing the, the, the water from the melting snow and glaciers. And then in this valley, it becomes really green, fertile. And this, is the, this valley is called Tinsmagang. This is the home village of Venerable Sangasena. It's a beautiful valley. It is also called a valley of the apricots. So you get beautiful apricots. Uh, Dr. Charlie was mentioning about when to go for fruits. That is, uh, Dr. Charlie, that's also my favorite time <laughs> going to Ladakh because we actually want to eat the apricots straight from the tree. And uh, you also get different varieties of apples as well. So we like to go in late summer or early autumn. This is where the apples will ripen 
the walnuts and the apricots are, are, are there, but uh, walnuts comes a bit later. Normally, we try to, to, to aim for the apricots, okay? And uh, you see a picture of a building here. This is actually the hotel that we stay in. <laughs> okay, beautiful valley, all right? Okay, here you have apples. So in Ladakh, there is an abundance of uh, various types of apple uh, apples because here in Malaysia, we just go to the supermarket and we just get certain types of varieties of apple. But in Ladakh, every tree is different, right? Sometimes you have one tree and the next tree, the apples taste uh, will be different. Sometimes in one tree, they might give the sweetest, the crunchiest apple that you ever tasted. It is so fantastic. And then you plug the apple from the next tree, it's mushy, it's flat tasting, it doesn't taste good. So you know that after people have tried apples on the tree, you know which, which, which tree they go for, <laughs> the tree with the best apples. And the same thing could also be said about apricots as well, because different trees will give different tasting uh, apricots. And uh, the, uh, the hotel that we stay in Ting Smagang, um, there are some um, very good apricot trees. Uh, after the apricots has fallen, the the big gems for that. But this is what happens: apricots. This is a grandma. She's eight, uh, ninety-three years old. She's the auntie of Venerable Sangarsena. She's drying apricots in the sun. Apricots last on the tree for about two weeks. So if you are too early, uh, apricots are not ripen. You come too late, the apricots are all fallen from the trees. Okay, so the timing needs to be right, and sometimes it's difficult because because sometimes the uh, um, summer could come a bit early or come come a bit later and uh, the apricots are also used to make apricot jam they're excellent apricot jam from the hotel that we stay yeah ah this is what you see a shorten in the highway and uh, so we are on our journey to pangong lake uh, pangong lake became very famous because in the final scene of the movie called the three idiots Hindustani movie. It's a very funny movie. Uh, won awards. You know, it's a very good movie. But the last part of the movie shows you the Pangong Lake, and the Pangong Lake is really quite fantastic. So beautiful. And uh, so we were traveling on this road to Pangong Lake. And it's very common to see shortens like this. Yeah. And uh, this shorten is uh, sometimes um, these are religious symbols to bring blessings to people traveling on this road. Sometimes places where accidents normally occur, they will also put a shorten down there in order to bring blessings. And uh, because the elevation is about 4,000 to 5,000 meters, uh, you will also see many low-lying clouds. So sometimes you'll be completely covered in clouds. Can you see how low the clouds are here? Yeah. These are the goats because we are now in the Chantang area. Chantang is about 16,000 feet above sea level. And that is about 3,000 feet above Mount Kinabalu. So it's really high elevation. And this is the best place for this type of goats, right? Uh, this kind of shaggy uh, goat. These goats have two coats of hair. The outer coat is the coarser coat. Uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is really for summer. When winter approach, they will have an undercoat, a soft down. So the soft down itself, uh, could actually be used for warm clothing. They're very soft and light. And in fact, they have been used to make Kashmir uh, textile. In fact, the Kashmir textiles uh, selling in New York or Paris, where it can cost you thousands of dollars, will come from farms like this. And uh, this goes a thorough bread. So uh, it is possible for you to trace who are the parents of this goat. Uh, who are who who are the grandparents of this goat? Who are the great grandparents of this goat? <laughs> so that they keep track of the family lineage in order to get the best uh, uh, the best fiber from the goats itself. But of course, the farmer is very very tough life. It is high in the mountains, uh, very arid. Summer is uh, winter is extremely cold, uh, and they don't get very much from this fiber. But then by that time it goes down and land up in Paris and New York, uh, the Kashmir become extremely expensive. The child that I sponsored actually come from a place like this, uh, coming from this area of Chantang. Here, uh, for photographers actually, going to Ladakh is one of the amazing sights, especially in the mountains. Can you see the mountain lights are quite amazing. You have these low-lying clouds and you've got a burst of sunshine on one side of the hills. 
Uh, this is not the kind of light that you get uh, in the low uh, in lowland. Um, now we don't normally see this kind of light when you go in a group, because sometimes uh, you make sure that you reach the hotel uh, when the sun is down, uh, just in, to, uh, ready for dinner. The reason why I was able to see some of these mountain lights was because uh, our journey here was a bit delayed uh, because uh, we had to wait for our our permits you know because as you go to the Pangong Lake this is a restricted area so you need the permit and we have to wait for the permits and our passports to come and therefore we started the journey a bit late and uh, therefore the, the the good thing is that uh, the sun as the sun was setting you begin to get uh, you are able to see the evening lights which is amazing very beautiful this is the Pangong Lake itself uh you know just as the sun is setting and we see wow this scene is fantastic this is maybe like a scenery from the lord of the rings and if you look closely you could actually see there is there is a little bit of a monastery down here uh, a choton it's not really a monastery very small structure and uh so in this pangong lake uh which is on the eastern side of Ladakh, 40 percent of this lake lies in india and 60 percent in tibet china and recently, there's a skirmish uh, along this lake. Uh, the lake lies on the line of actual control. And uh, so sometimes uh, in the mountain pass, uh, boundary borders are not uh, are poorly defined. And the rivers keep changing courses. So sometimes it is difficult to know where the border, border lies. Uh, in winter, this, the waters will freeze. So it is possible for you to travel from the Indian side of the Pango Lake to the Chinese side. Yeah? And this is another uh, scenery of Pangon Lake uh, in the evening. Uh, the, the water becomes blue, very deep blue. Uh, sometimes the color can change to green or to red. All right. So the colors itself can change. Uh, many colors in this Pangong Lake. Uh, this is uh, Pangong Lake during the day. And uh, I was sitting on a rock and trying to be like a Guruji sitting on a, on a rock. But you could see that the waters of this lake is it's, it's beautiful. It's clear water, and this lake itself, like, is a hidden gem. As I mentioned, that this was used as a site for the uh, Hindustani blockbuster, The Three Idiots. Check it out. I'm sure you'll enjoy this movie, and The Three Idiots. And the beauty of the colors makes you really wonder: Is this place real? You know, or is it just camera tricks? And uh, as a result of this movie, The Three Idiots, many Indian tourists now come over to the Pangong Lake. You know? So this has now become a tourist tourist attraction. And this is another part of the evening lights, mountain lights. Here you have the setting sun uh, lighting up the scenery in gold and it gets reflected in the water. Amazing, isn't it? The mountain lights. Okay, so that is the mountain side. Actually, I have so many pictures, but I have to uh, make sure that I don't put too many pictures. Otherwise, uh, you know, by the time uh, I give the presentation, half the crowd would have actually left. <laughs> so I had to select the pictures, but um, there are many amazing pictures of Ladakh. Let us move on to the next section, which is on monks. Okay, these are the monks. So Ladakh has remained secluded from the rest of the world. Uh, the, the rural areas are inaccessible. It's mountainous, it's remote, it's isolated. And uh, they are cut off actually from the rest of India between six to seven months because of the wintry climate in the high mountains. And so what the families would do is they like to sit around. The kitchen is the best place in the house because the stove is always on. So you get warm and you can drink butter tea, you can eat roasted barley and cakes. And maybe take a nap on the low bunches. Yeah? So the kitchen is the best place. Yeah? Uh, so the Ladakhis are really the Tibeto Burma, and some of them are the Indo Aryan descent as you move closer to Pakistan and Kashmir uh, and uh, Pakistan. And their culture has been strongly influenced by Tibetan uh, Buddhism. Mm. So in the past, it was very common for a family to have one or two sons to become a monk in a monastery. And every house will have a, a shrine upstairs. Uh, for them to do their puja. Uh, so having sons as monks means that you actually have less mouth to feed. 
And the other thing is the boys will learn how to read and write, which is part of monastic training, which is good for the boys. So whether they, or not they want to remain as monks or return back to their lay life, at least they know how to read and write. And you can see how beautiful the uh, the murals are. So every temple will have murals like this. <laughs> this is Venerable Sangasena. He was a founder of Mahabodhi International Meditation Center. And... Uh, but MIMC is not only a meditation center in Leh. Uh, this is really an amazing project that has transformed. Uh, it is 250 acres of deserted or barren land. And Venerable Sangasena used to say that not even a grass will grow here. It is just absolutely dry. It's a desert. But he was given 250 acres. And so he wanted to build a campus uh, for uh, learning for children, especially children from underprivileged families. Uh, so, so he established a campus, he has residential schools here. Uh, besides uh, a school in Leh, there are also uh, Mahabodhi branch campus, uh, branch schools in two other villages. And uh, he has also a school for the blind and visually impaired students. Uh, there is a hospital, a home for poor folks, uh, old folks, uh, those who cannot walk or work anymore. And uh, besides that, there are also guest houses for visitors and where you have a twin sharing room with a touch bathroom. So we are quite comfortable. So we stay in these uh, guest rooms. There is hot water. And the income that is received from the visitors help uh, to provide the income to sustain the campus. So it's a good idea for, for us to go to Ladakh one day because by so doing, not only do we experience something completely different, uh, we also have a chance to support uh, MIMC. Okay. Uh, because uh, you know the uh, your uh, your accommodation and food and all that your expenses have becomes income for them so uh, he joined the indian army when he was 17 uh, because that was the in thing to do he actually he was very impressed with the, with the uniform that the army uses so he was attracted by the uniform <laughs> and actually at 17 years old he was just one year younger than the 18 which is the required age but he ma he managed to look at the recruiting officer in the eye and convince him that that he, he he's able to do what other people are doing yeah <laughs> actually in Ladakh there was nothing else that he can actually do except to join the army so that was that was a very glamorous thing for him to do he was the youngest in the platoon but he was the most outstanding also so one day what happens is that he has a relative by the name of uh, Biko Ananda he became a monk at uh, Mahabodhi Society in uh, Bangalore. And he spoke to uh, uh, Venerable Sangasena about the value of compassion in the monastic, monastic life. After talking to his uh, relative, he realized that what is he uh, doing with his life? Why does he want to become a soldier? So at that time, he actually decided to become a monk. <laughs> so he became a monk at the age of 21. From 17, was uh, joined the army. 21, he became a monk at, in the Bangalore. Again, this is the background is in the monastery, <laughs> Tibetan monastery. Okay, so Venerable Sangatina here was giving a talk and was leading chanting. Actually, Venerable has got a lovely musical voice. He's got a good sense of humor and he delivers his words of wisdom with so much modesty. Uh, here we are at, and, uh, you know, having some kind of chanting just outside. Mm. Uh, this young monk that's looking at Venerable Sangatina, he is Bhante's nephew. His name is Jinananda. He's the administrator at MIMC. I thought this picture is really quite nice. The way he looks at Venerable Sangasena. <laughs> His elder brother is also a monk. His name is Venerable Nagasena. He was the one who introduced to me the idea of Ladakh. He said, you know, in our schools, we are singing the songs that you write. And I was so amazed, you know, like, where is Ladakh? <laughs> so uh, Venerable Nagasena introduced me to Ladakh. And his sister is also a nun trained in Taiwan. And she speaks Chinese better than English, okay? <laughs> All right. So, uh, Venerable Sangasini has little monks and little nuns under training. And these uh, projects of great compassion are supported by uh, donations from overseas guests who visit the campus. And some other people come over to the campus uh, they start giving some kind of donation. You see at the back, there are students all in their uniform. In front, there are uh, monks and nuns. Actually, they are chanting before we start going off to the mountains. Huh? Uh, the Ladakhis are poor. 
and so they can give uh, they don't give give much so it is with the foreign donation that this campus is run and these are some old photographs you see uh, nine years of monastic training at Bangalore uh, venerable Sangha decided to return to Ladakh his idea is that he wants to teach meditation <laughs> he said that when he first advertised that he wanted to teach meditation in lay, three people turned up for the meditation class and they were on their uh, upper floor, first, first story. So he got them sitting down and he asked them to wash the breath. This is what you call Anapanasati, watching the breath. Huh? And then he was watching the breath and after a while the room was awfully quiet. When he opened his eyes, he saw that everybody has left and the room was empty and when he looked out the window he saw these three three people they've gone downstairs and they were laughing because um they are more used to the tibetan tradition in which uh meditation is based on chant more mantras and chanting and they don't see the value of why do you want to wash the breath so then bhante realized that meditation is probably for people who have food on the table <laughs> but it's not a priority for the local people their priority is to provide education, basic education in schools. But the Ladakhis in the mountains are really poor. There are no education facilities for the children. And even if there are facilities, the parents are too poor to send their kids to school. So he feels, what, what should he do? Maybe he should try to open a school for, for these kids. And here you see a tent with three children in front. This is not at only a tent. This is a home for the people. This is in the Chantang area. This is where my sponsored child comes from, eh? where they have goats, or mountain goats. So they live in this area. And can you imagine in winter where the temperature can fall below 40 degrees centigrade or even colder than that. And when the wind starts blowing, because you had hardly any trees to stop, wow, with the wind chill factor, it becomes wow, oh, very, very cold. Uh, you see, so the people live as herdsmen. And uh, so Bhante's heart felt that he really must do something for this, these poor children. And I find that this picture is really amazing. Can you see this little girl? Look at her hair. Look at how she, dark she is being op uh, open to the sun, you know. Uh, and, you know, the girls in Ladakh tend to be very, very neglected because in their society, women lies at the bottom of the rank of priorities. And illiteracy in the mountains is really high, especially the girls. So if there is education, education is probably for the boys and not for the girls. So Bante decided to establish a residential school, first at MIMC, and he started with, with five children, <laughs> you know, five children. Now it has grown to 550 students uh, of comprising males and female. So, uh, the successful uh, school in MIMC in Leh uh, means that he could actually start a branch, branch schools in his village in Tingsmagang and another village called Bukabur. And each of them will have about 120 students each, you know. He felt that the little girls in the mountainous regions could get some education. It will really empower them. It will completely change their lives. So this is the girl that, that you see from the Chantang was brought to Leh for schooling. And after she's clean up, after she got a haircut, after she changed her clothes into the uniform, wow, it's quite amazing. You will not recognize her anymore. And this is a picture. This is one of the early pictures of Bante walking with children behind, behind him. You know, when they, they are given a nice haircut, they look so different now. Eh? And this picture is really a symbolic picture of Reverend Sankasini leading little girls to a brighter future. So they do no longer have to slog in the mountains looking after goats collecting wood and grass, walking half a kilometer to collect water from the stream. So after the schools for the girls came up, uh, it was just a small house, a small building which they have for the, for the girls. People started asking, Bante, how about having a school for the Ladaki boys as well? So then he started taking in the boys and so now we can school educational. That is the residential school in MIMC. And when he started the project, he thought, oh, maybe he will get a donation from Japan and Europe because the people in Japan and Europe are tends to be quite wealthy. But the problem is he doesn't know anybody in Europe or Japan. <laughs> and the local people thought he was crazy. They mock him. They say, oh, this is a crazy monk. Thinking one to want to build a campus in a, in a land where there is no water, no money, no road. But he was not discouraged because he has a strong calling. 
He feels that he can do it. He says that it is not no problem. What he needs to do is to write his ideas on a piece of paper and get it printed out. A piece of paper don't cost much, just some ink on the, on the paper. And then if people uh, saw his sincerity and compassion, the funds started coming in. And that is how the project grew. It's quite amazing. Huh? And here you see, this is the early school. <laughs> uh, you see the students here. Yeah? This is how it started. Uh, can you see how lovely and clean the girls are? Yeah, They're all dressed up like that with their caps. Yeah. So after, um, so the uh, children are taken from very poor families and they're actually given the best education in Ladakh. And so the numbers ha have actually grown and uh, in the Leh itself, it's, uh, it's, they have residential facilities. In Tinsmagang and Bukabul, very limited uh, residential facilities because people could come from home, right? And this was how the early picture of the campus, 250 acres all spread out. And you see it is actually like a desert and, but they managed to get some bits of water and managed to grow some trees, all right? So when it started, there was no water, no proper roads, just harsh desert land. But it's through his tenacity and compassion over so many years that Mahabodhi campus begin to emerge. And it is very fortunate that the campus is actually sitting on a large store of fresh water, fresh underground water that has been accumulating through the centuries because of the melting snow and it's trapped underground. The problem is how to get the water from underground up so that you can use this water. Otherwise, there is no water. It's arid like a desert. Then something happens. <laughs> something happens. Uh, there is a water project from Sister Ramona from Sandakan. Sister Ramona happens to go on the trip led by uh, Dato Charlie. And when she went to see the project of um, uh, at IMC, she was very deeply touched and she was actually crying, actually, to see this project. And she feels that, okay, this is something that I can help. And when she asked uh, Venerable Sangasena, how much do you need? He started mentioning all the minor projects. He said, no, 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 some more. How much do you need? And so the, the, uh, the, the, the costing of things started rising, rising, rising. And he says, tell me, how much do you need? But actually, Sister Ramona do have the financial support. Yeah? So uh, she donated this water project. They were able to pump the water from underground. It's like an artisan well. And they get very good quality water underground that is now being used for general household usage, for washing, and for agriculture. All right. And uh, so this project is also in memory for the father as well, because she wanted to see something good, you know, something that can actually make a difference in the lives of people. Mm. So Sister Ramona will always be remembered for her outstanding gift to the Lada Keys. In Italian, they probably call her Santa Ramona, means the Lady Saint Ramona, you know, for giving this kind of uh, support uh, to, uh, uh, to the Lada Keys. Huh? And this is how the campus looks like. So from an arid desert-like landscape, uh, the water project under Sister Ramona has now transformed the campus into an oasis. Now you have apple trees and apricot trees. You have vegetables that they can use uh, for eating and also sell, actually. And they are also grown flowers. So Sister Ramona was like, as if being sent by the devas to help MIMC out and to bring the project to fruition. And they are also, they are using also solar panels in order to generate power. So now you also have pipe hot water, hot water coming from the pipe, which is very much needed because it's very cold in the mountains, especially during winter. Uh, this is the meditation hall at my MC campus. And you could see the trees are what, these are what you call poplar trees. Poplar, uh, P-O-P-L-A-R, poplar. And poplar is uh, good for making houses because it's because the timber runs straight up, so you can use it as raftings, as pillars for your for your for your for your for construction material. And um, uh, can you see the barren landscape at the back? <laughs> so this was how it was like, you know, becoming an oasis of apple trees and apricot trees. Now during one of the tours that I led, the brother Henry Bay which came along with, uh, with my group, donated uh, towards the expansion of this meditation hall. So this meditation hall 
uh, is expanded because um, MIMC runs camps and retreats for yoga and meditation, attracting participants from many parts of the world. All right, so this is the meditation hall. And here you could see students in an assembly. Uh, they come in at the age of six and they study up to from four, where later on, after from four, they leave for, for, for college. So MIMC considered to be one of the best schools in India. Uh, the students are performing very well. They win awards at the national level. At the, this is competition in India. The students will win awards. And some of the students, uh, many of the students have gone to college and some have graduated even with PhD. Can you imagine? These are students from very deprived background up in the mountains. They're actually taken and they're being, being given the education facilities and completely changed everything, completely changed. So they say that education is a great equalizer and it has the power to change the destinies of these ladder kids. So these girls and boys no longer have to be confined, uh, destined to be herdsmen and farmers. Their lives completely change because of the opportunity that's given to them. And here we are at the female uh, hostel and the MC was, uh, was one of the students here and sh she spoke in flawless English. We were told that she was brought into MIMC with two other little girls when they were very young. They were like six years old. And that year, winter was very bad, very bitter that year in her village. The village was covered with snow and ice. So an army captain brought in the three girls to MIMC. They brought, he brought these girls to, uh, um, uh, to Bante to say that, can they, these three girls take shelter at MIMC to get food and warm shelter and maybe some education. He says that when the weather gets warmed up after winter, he will come back and take the, the girls in and take her the home. So Venerable Sangha Sena waited for a couple of years and the, never saw the captain. The captain didn't return. So one day when he saw the captain, he said, Hey, captain, do you remember you're supposed to bring in the three girls back once winter is over? The captain replied, Oh, Bante, you must be joking because the girls are so well taken care of here in MIMC. Why should I bring them home? They're so much better here. Ah, so can you see that when a girl from a deprived background gets good education, she can speak flawless English and she can perform as well as any city girl from a privileged background. So Venerable Sankar Sena is right. Education is a great equalizer and it completely changes the life of these girls. Uh, they no longer have to be illiterate. They no longer have to work in the mountains carrying bales of wood and uh, uh, on a back or to turn animals. It's completely changed now. Some of them go to colleges. Yeah? So unlike the usual uh, education that is normally offered at monasteries, the monks and nuns here study the Indian national curriculum like the lay people. So they are given the normal secular training besides getting religious training. So this actually gives them the option. Uh, later on, if they decide not to main, remain as a monk or a nun, they can go out and uh, look for a job. And this is uh, Venerable uh, Cho Sang. He's now under training in Myanmar. Uh, yeah. So after the training is over, he will uh, be able to do some uh, service for the Buddhist community. And uh, this picture was taken at a branch called Bokabur, uh, which is quite close to Kashmir. And you can see how lovely the, the, the children are. That's what our Malaysian ladies, when they're given an opportunity to sponsor these this children, they're so captivated by the lovely children. <laughs> these are Ladakhi children. <laughs> and this is Stenzin Danchen. Uh, he was a very bright boy in Bokabur in school. See, brown sparkling hazel brown eyes lovely eyes and the next year that i came he became the master of ceremony for the concert and he where you know he's got a prepared script you know and he was reading it uh, very very good english so uh now sandwich has grown up and he has become a monk in a poor and he's got such lovely eyes now i hope that the ladaki female devotees don't give him trouble so that he will uh, continue to remain as a monk. <laughs> okay, uh, now this is not Ladakhi. This is Jin Yang from Penang, whom I sponsored for the Ladakh tour. That year, I sponsored both Jin Yang and Joshua Ku. Both of them are of the same age, and they took uh, the public speaking course at, uh, that we conduct at BGF. 
So he was only about 18 years old that I brought uh, Jin Yang and Joshua over to MIMC. And he actually loved Ladakh. So uh, because he has undergone the public speaking course, so we push him, hey, Jin Yang, you better go up the stage and make, some, make a speech. <laughs> So after his Ladakh, uh, Ladakh trip, he went over to Tokyo at Waseda University to get to do his bachelor's degree. He won a, he won a scholarship. I was told that he's got a few scholarships, <laughs> so he must be <laughs> he must be doing very well in Japan and graduated with a distinction. And after that, he won another scholarship to do his master's degree at Tsinghua University in Beijing. Now uh, he's uh, working. Uh, while uh, planning to pursue for his PhD, he wants to do his PhD study. So this is a Jin Yang. Uh, you know, when you go over to Ladakh, you fall in love with Ladakh. <laughs> you fall in love with the, with the people. Uh, now, let me also mention about Jin Yang. After his graduation, because of his love for Ladakh, he started the Vera Life Academy to run the summer schools uh, at in Ladakh, you know. So he runs retreats in, in yoga, shiatsu, meditation, trekking. Uh, his participants come from different parts of the world. Uh, Jin Yang himself is now, uh, is, uh, uh, he, is a, he can be an instructor of yoga. He's been trained as an instructor. And uh, he also has started some eco-tourism projects uh, to conduct uh, mindfulness retreats and expedition in Ladakh. He already ran two summer camps, but unfortunately because of the uh, COVID-19, the, the camps, camps have to be, he could not can continue the camp, so he's got to be suspended for a while. Meanwhile, he has also raised funds uh, to buy the heating system for the Mahabodhi Old Age Home. He also raised funds to buy furniture for our body school, for the rural nomadic schools, and also for the Mahabodhi Hospital. It's quite incredible for somebody in the early 20s, don't you think? <laughs> Jin Yang has really done well, and I feel very happy that you know, even for the Malaysians who goes on there, people, uh, you know, they, they want to do something in order to make a difference in the lives of other people. Mm. One of the things that we do when we go over to Ladakh is to give, bring gifts uh, to the students at MIMC because it brings so much joy to the students who look forward for the visitors from Malaysia and Singapore. So what we do is that uh, we uh, build in the cost of gifts in our tour package and uh, then we arrange in order to get this this gifts available so when we're there we will give presents to the so that they just love it huh? uh, so this is one of the one of the contributions that we can do uh when uh visitors come to the mimc is to give child sponsorship uh, by child sponsorship means that you give a lump sum contribution once a year and this you cover expenses for the child for his food accommodation living expenses and all that and that means it reduces the heavy burden on MIMC. They have to depend on international funds to help to support the children. There's so many children and the children have to be fed, have to be clothed and for them to be able to sustain, right? So this is the project of compassion. Later on, Dr. Charlie will talk a little bit about how if you want to get into this kind of a sponsorship of a child, you can do so. Now I'm going to speak to you about some, some sponsored child, which is quite interesting. Uh, this. A uh, young boy is called Mingo Tam Chos. He was a student at Bikabur uh, Branch School. And at that time when I, when I brought a group, he was a master of ceremony of the student performance. He was bright and he spoke excellent English. And uh, you know, so the students will study in the school up to the age of 14 years old. And after that, they were moved from Bukabur to the main campus in Leh in order to do the secondary education. So the people, so uh, we were told when we were there that there are some many children there in the Bokabo school that don't have sponsors. So um, my group members wants to sponsor the children, but we do not know how to choose, right? <laughs> because they give us a long list of names, oh, I don't know how to choose. So the, the request is that can the children who have not been sponsored, please stand in a row. So the students were standing in a row and uh, Minko Tamchas was actually standing down there, right? standing in line with all the children. And our women folks were so fascinated by the beautiful gifts. So they, we came down with, there was a kind of a platform. They came down to the platform, rushing <laughs> each of them, getting a child for sponsorship. You may think like a jumble seal or what. <laughs> so, um, uh, but Mingo was actually standing in line, but he was being overlooked 
I do not know why he was overlooked. Maybe they think, oh, he's just a master of ceremony. He probably is so bright, he probably have a sponsor. Uh, but actually, Mingo was not sponsored. He, he, so he's standing because he's not a sponsored child. There one of our member uh, from Singapore, his name is uh, Richard C. And uh, he saw, Richard has got a very sharp eye. <laughs> Richard is a very talented person with a sharp eye. And he said, Mingo was actually standing alone. So he went to Mingo, he says, Mingo, uh, he says, do you have a sponsor? And Mingo says, no, you know. So uh, then Richard says, okay, then in which case I will sponsor you. Wow. Mingo was so happy that even tears were running through, under uh, running, you know, so he actually had to run away because he was actually crying. Because education is so expensive for the poor Ladakhi family. And Mingo has finally found a sponsor. <laughs> so there was there must be a special day uh, that uh, when Richard found Mingo and Mingo had a sponsor for him and I remember that when we were departing in our vehicle, our vehicle Mingo was running behind our vehicle sh waving his hands at us uh, together with a man who could possibly be his father now what happened to Mingo Mingo is now 20 years old and he's already finished a school at I MIMC and he's now studying commerce in Lake and he wants um, one day to come to Singapore to work. And he's so respectful of Richard. He calls Richard, Sir Richard. Wow, <laughs> how wonderful. And all he's, you know, thinking about the sponsors. Wow, wonderful. Mingor. <laughs> Mingo time choice. Uh, uh, then you see me standing with a, with a young boy. Now his name is uh, Jigmik Norbu. He was a child that I was sponsoring since he was 12, uh, six years old. So I sponsored him actually for 12 years. He comes from a small family, a poor family in the cold Changtang Mountains. And you saw the Changtang Mountains, right? The one with the tent. Uh, he has actually turned 18 years old this year and he was actually looking for a job. So he's no longer in MIMC. Jingna actually turned out to be a tall young fella. When I was there, I haven't heard him speaking, haven't heard his voice because he's so quiet and so shy. <laughs> but apparently he loves playing football and he's, he's good in maths. But uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, he, um, was it last year? Last year, he had a, a ruptured appendix at home in the mountains. And so the journey to bring him down from the mountains to the hospital in late took many hours. There was also a traffic jam. So unfortunately, we lost uh, Jim Net. Uh, he died of appendicitis. And uh, he comes from a very poor family. He was the oldest child. He was not able to earn money to, to help the family. Now, there is also another picture. And this is the picture of Lord Antonio. <laughs> I think easier to call him London. Loldon is not so easy for us, Loldon Tanya. Now at MIMC, the big boys will look after the younger boys. So London was looking after Jingmet like a big brother, okay? And they were actually a good match because uh, London was very chatty while Jingmet was very quiet. And, uh, you know, so London has also finished, uh, uh, not only from IMC, he's finished his bachelor's degree, he's finished his master's degree, he's now working for his PhD. So can you see how amazing it is for Reverend San Casino to have established uh, education and the children are doing so well now. So at IMIMC, there are also home for the agent. And this is the home for the visually uh, impaired and the blind. And uh, many of the visually impaired uh, children. Yeah, Here you can see that the, uh, the, this is a resident uh, from the home for the agent offering flowers and uh, AL, they, the older folks will plant flowers and the place is most beautiful with the flowers. So they took flowers from the garden and offers to us. Yeah? So we go into the uh, home for the agent in uh, uh, this is Shirley Yeo from Singapore. Uh, she says that very often sponsors will go for the monks. After the monks are taken out, then they go for the nuns. And after the nuns are taken out, they go for the children. But very few people think of sponsoring elderly people. They always want to go for the cute ones, <laughs> the, little, uh, the little children. So this is a, a Sister Shirley Yeo from Singapore. And she has actually sponsored a Ladakhi female. Uh, uh, an elderly woman who has to be also sponsored as well. 
and this is the home for the agent they are the residents of the uh, agent at MIMC actually they are the happiest people in the campus they have no complaints uh, being old they are no longer fit at home their limbs are no longer strong for them to walk up the mountain slopes they had no more no longer had the strength to do farm work cannot carry water from the stream and they eat what is left at the dining table because the most substantial food is actually set aside for the younger members who need the strength to do hard work so actually it is very tough being an old person in uh, Ladakh mm, and the, during winter it's very tough on them so Venerable Sangasena decided to establish a home for the old folks and he opened the old folks uh, at IMC in order to care for them now unlike other homes here the children from the schools will come and interact with the old folks and care for the elderly so you can see the interaction between the young and the old folks and it brings some kind of happiness and connection between the two different generations huh? <laughs> it's wonderful yeah uh, this is brother Jerry Ong from Singapore who came with me with Ladakh with his wife and two children when we were in at the Mahabodhi school in Bokabor, uh, we were told that they need a bus because the children uh, there are not much residential facilities the children have to walk they have to walk and sometimes it's really tough you know uh, because they live far away from school uh, so the group of Malaysians and Singaporeans decided to sponsor the bus and the main sponsor was Jerry Jerry uh, brother Jerry Ong from Singapore uh, then the following year, Brother Jerry came to Ladakh with us again, and then he took a picture of the bus that, that, that where he was the main sponsor. Can you see Bukabur? <laughs> and when we are in the Bukabur, we heard that actually the school in the um, Tinsmagang, the bus caught fire. <laughs> so they don't have bus. So then we, our group said, never mind, we raised some money to buy a bus. So our group donated two buses, <laughs> two school buses for the children. And do you know what it means by walking in winter? This is the terrain that the children have to walk if you don't have buses. Can you imagine the little kids walking on this road like that during winter? Wow, wow, tough. Yeah. So a school bus is very badly needed. Yeah? So sometimes we live in comfortable lives and we take our lives almost too easy. We don't realize the difficulty that kids in other parts of the world experience. And this uh, project by this this mission, this work by Reverend Sakazini is actually so amazing. All right. Now we'll move on to the next portion. We go to monasteries. <laughs> Ladakh is famous for the monasteries because it speaks to the spiritual nature of the Ladakhis. Every village will have its own monastery with its own story. This is Tikshe Monastery. It's about 17 kilometers from Leh, and it belongs to the Galupa order. And in the Galupa order, the Dalai Lama is head of the, of the order. The monastery is, uh, is about uh, 3,600 meters high, or about 11,800 meters up above the sea level. And it is on the right side of the Indus, Indus River. So the uh, monastery is 12 story, and uh, on the side of a hill, and this resembles Potala Palace in Lhasa. So they, it, they say this is the uh, Ladakit Potala. <laughs> and of course, for the monastery, the most important part of the monastery uh, uh, located on the top, huh? the one that is colored red. And we will go there, I'll bring you there, okay? This is an, another monastery. Now, as you cross the Nubra Valley, or the Valley of Flowers, you remember the Kadongla Pass? 18,000 feet above sea level, we cross onto the other side, across the mountains, to the Karakoram Mountains, and then we come across these old monasteries. There are many monks here, and the shrines has a wonderful energy. It seems to reflect the many monks that have prayed in the halls through the many centuries. So we actually uh, you know, feel the ambience of this place. Now, let me show you the, this monastery from a different perspective. You can see this monastery is set in between rocks and all that, right? In the side of a mountain. At the back is a snow-covered mountain. Now, let us see another picture. Now, can you see the monastery? It is set up in the mountains, uh, and I'm taking the picture from a valley. Yeah? So the Ladakhi thinks that it is an act of great merit to build monasteries on mountains. 
you can imagine it takes a lot of effort to bring the building materials, the wood, the, the cement and all that, and to build the monastery by hand where you don't have much, uh, much uh, machinery. Of course, in the past, early century, they don't have, uh, they don't have uh, machinery. And the um, building materials have to be brought up by animals, by human strength. And they think that the more effort you make in building a monastery, the more meritorious they get. So they build a monastery up in the mountains. Ayo. <laughs> Can you imagine a mo monastery like that? <laughs> this is an iconic, this is a beautiful monastery. This is a Tiger Nose Monastery. And it can be seen on a highway as you travel from Lei to Hermes Monastery. Uh, it is called Chamre Monastery. This was built in 1664. And it's about six, 40 kilometers from Lei. All right. Uh, at one time, it was, this was this, is, uh, uh, this uh, monastery with, that was built by uh, Lama. It dedicated this monastery to a king. <laughs> All right. So now I passed this monastery a couple of times. But could not take a good picture because sometimes it's a bit like misty and hazy and all that. But this time around, was able to get uh, the blue skies and the blue skies is also reflected in the stream that flows by. So this is a beautiful picture. And uh, actually in Ladakh, as you get out of the city, the Himalayan air is so free from haze. Yeah, sometimes you can't even tell the distance because you don't have a haze to tell you that as it gets more hazy, that is more distant. You don't have a sense of distance because everything is so clear. And sometimes it's so clear that the mountains look as if you're cut with cutboards and pasted on the blue sky. It's like that. The sky is so blue, clear blue. And the mountains is like being pieces of cardboard stuck on the sky. <laughs> that is like that. <laughs> and of course, sometimes in the, at night, when the moon is not up, when you don't have moon, you see the starry skies. Yeah. Provided if you're in the city, you will probably will not be able to see the sky so well. Uh, this is a statue of Guru Rinpoche or Guru Padmasambhava or known as the Precious Guru. He has come from the Swat Valley. Uh, uh, Swat Valley is located in the modern day Pakistan. So in other words, these days, we will call him a Pakistani teacher. <laughs> so he came from Pakistan and he was the one who brought Buddhism to Tibet because at that time, Swat Valley was a bustling Buddhist center. Yeah. From Swat Valley, then you go up the, the, the Karakura Mountains and you land up in China, actually. Uh, so he came to Tibet in the 8th century when he was invited by the king called Tristan Jackson of Tibet. Uh, Guru Parmasambhava is said to have mastered the tantric arts and he's said to have subdued the demons in Tibet and transformed them into Dharma protectors. So actually, in the Buddhist tradition, you don't harm the demons, but you transform them from negative becomes positive. So throughout the Himalayans, whether you are in Tibet, Nepal, Bhutan, there are caves and spots associated with Guru Padmasambhava, Guru Rinpoche, all right? And Guru Rinpoche actually introduced this uh, charm dance, uh, this uh, religious dance. Uh, if you're lucky, you can attend a festival featuring the charm dance because they only perform this dance in, at fixed festivals. So the um, religious mass and costume dance performed at mon monasteries where the monks will play these long horns and drums and bells and all that. Now this dance, we witnessed this dance because we were participants of the Ladakh uh, Cultural Heritage Festival. And uh, of course, the uh, costumes and the headdress are very heavy and you need the strength to perform this dance. Sometimes you have to hop around and jump around and twirl around with the cymbals and the 20-foot trumpets played by the monk. So, it's, uh, so this is the chum dance. <coughs> and here in Tikshe Monastery, we have gone to the roof, Tikshe Monastery, at uh, dawn. Uh, you have two monks blowing the conch shell at the rooftop of Tikshe at the break of dawn. I think this picture is quite famous because uh, people like to take this picture. I've seen this, uh, this kind of picture even in videos and all that. Of course, this is my picture. I did not take it from anywhere, but uh, I think it's a lovely blowing the conch shell uh, at the break of dawn. Because the conch shell, the white conch shell is one of the eight auspicious Tibetan symbols. It represents the fame of the Buddhist teaching spreading in all directions like the sound of the conch shell. 
So we just go up the roof and waited for the monks. And then the monks, two monks came, they put on the, 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 the hat uh, of the Galupa tradition and blow this horn, all right? And you could see as the sun rises, the valley in front uh, gets lighted up. And you, if you can see the river, that is the Indus River. And a closer look at the concha, these are the concha that is used for the monks. The monks will blow this concha three times. And uh, so uh, in between the blowing, this was taken during the interval. So because you got conch shell, and this conch shell are found in the mountains, it means that the mountains in Ladakh was at one time at the bottom of the sea. Because conch shells are normally found in beaches or in the ocean bed. Yeah? So this, is, this means that Ladakh was actually at the bottom of the sea before it becomes Himalayas and mountains. Ah, uh, this is a very beautiful Maitreya Buddha. Uh, it, uh, it's uh, 49 feet uh, tall or 15 meters. Uh, it's Maitreya Buddha. Uh, Buddha to come. Uh, Buddha come, the next Buddha. It covers two stories of the building. So this is a very beautiful statue of Maitreya. Because it's beautiful, it's just so famous. <laughs> and uh, this is the future Buddha. Uh, unlike uh, most statue of Maitreya, which sits on a throne, uh, this one sits in the lotus posture. So you want to see the lower part of the body, you go to the lower story. And uh, this is taken at the upper story of the, of the building. This is in Tikshe Monastery. All right. And um, so uh, the next Buddha will, will uh, give his teachings after the teachings of Sakyamuni Buddha completely disappears from the world. Maitreya comes from the Sanskrit word means Maitri, means love and kindness. So this is the main characteristic of this Buddha, of love and kindness. Uh, Maitreya Buddha, when the idea of Maitreya Buddha went to China, he was being transformed into the laughing Buddha. So the Buddha with a very big stomach. So the Buddhist uh, or the Chinese, the laughing Buddha looks very different from the Ladakhi <laughs> uh, Maitreya Buddha. All right. Can you see around the monasteries? And this is how the monastery, this is the monastery door and how Maitreya wearing this crown and you can look into the interior of the monastery. Yeah, these are two monks. We happen to be there and uh, the two monks are sitting on the monastery steps. The young monk on the right is absorbed eating an apple. So somebody has given him an apple and the monk on the left is somewhat uh, alarmed as if he wanted to say something to the monk. And there's a sweet wrapper in his hand because we just started giving them sweets and giving them apple. <laughs> and there's some, actually, there's some mucus in his nose. So he has some runny nose. And he's got some drawings. I think he was drawing like some tattoos on spider on his arm. <laughs> this, these monks are really cute. <laughs> these are the two Ladaki monks. So they joined the monastery very young. They learned how to read and write. And later on, when they grow up, they can do something else. They can remain as a monk if they want, otherwise they return to lay light. <laughs> this is a young novice. Early in the morning, after they blow the crown shell at the, at the rooftop, then we come down the staircase, wait at the monastery door, and the young monks will come running. They will chant the prayers at the top of their voice. This one chanting a prayer to Lama Songkhapa. <laughs> so uh, the, the older monks will prepare the shrine. The younger monks will Chant at the top of their voice so loud <laughs> before they enter the uh, their prayer hall. Uh, so they, I captured this picture of this young monk chanting. And uh, you know the monasteries, the monks look after themselves as a community, and the young novices will live with the older monks as part of the family. So the novice doesn't have a mother to look after. So now he's got a senior monk who looks after him like grandpa, you know, a grandpa looking after. So he's seated beside a grandpa monk <laughs> who looks after him. And this is what you have early in the morning because uh, it is early morning. Uh, after the chanting, there's a break in the they drink their butter tea. And this is uh, bali, eh? uh, roasted barley that they can put in the butter tea so it sustains the stomach. This is served at the morning puja. This is what we see as you sit in the monastery uh, at the side where the monks chant. It is actually very fascinating. Huh? You see the activity and uh, this young monk looking at the uh, 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 the uh, teenager monk uh, uh, scooping out, you know, giving giving his bali. 
All right. So this is um, so the village boys joined the monastery as monks, uh, as an early life. So they learn how to read and write Tibetan. They learn how to chant, learn how to participate in religious ceremonies. So when they grow up, they can choose. Uh, so uh, Reverend Sangasena is now growing young monks in MIMC. Some of them will remain in ropes when they grow up. Some others they will disrobe. And because they have received the Indian educational syllabus, they can join the lay life. This this picture of this monk was not from MIMC. He was from Tikshe Monastery. And I, I just like the look of his eyes. He looks very pensive, as if his mind is somewhere else. Uh, this is, this is uh, we took, I took a picture of him uh, while he was in the uh, Maitreya Buddha shrine. He was there, maybe just cleaning up and pouring water in the bowls. Uh. So when he saw us, he just stood aside and he looked so pensive in this, you know. Uh, we thought this a lovely picture. And uh, this is Bodhidharma. He is from MIMC. He's now under training in Myanmar. Uh, Reverend Sangasena sends out young monks to Myanmar so that they become knowledgeable monks, they learn how to meditate, they can lead community, the Buddhist community after some years of training. Uh, so these Ladakhi monks can serve overseas centers because they speak good English. And especially when they're given good monastic training yeah, and education. So Venerable Sangasena is a real model for the young monks because he's a master that have actually put compassion into action. He bears so much burden on his shoulders, so much worry on how to keep the center running so that the other people, the children, the, uh, the, peop the agent and all that, all could benefit from his work. He has a heart of great compassion. In fact, he's a living bodhisattva. Yeah, so this is a picture of Tikshay Monastery. And uh, it's got a double rainbow, which is considered to be very auspicious. Double rainbow over the Tikshay Monastery. So after visiting the Maitreya Shrine, and after taking the previous picture, it started drizzling. Then some people say, hey, let's get back to the car because it started raining. So we had to run down to our vehicle in the car park. And just as our vehicle was coming downhill, whew, the rainbows appeared before our eyes. And the most amazing thing is you can see the two ends of the rainbow touching the ground. Because normally we just see rainbows in the sky. We never see them touching the ground. It was such an amazing sight and so auspicious for us. After uh, going over to Turkish Monastery, participating in the Puja, going around the monastery, uh, making donations and all that. And then coming down, you have this double rainbow. Wow. <laughs> okay, so uh, so you can see the walls of the monastery. There are murals and uh, obviously it looks old. And this is nice because when it is old, it looks so authentic. Uh, so you will experience a little Tibet when you go to Bhutan. Uh, well, sorry, when you go to Ladakh. Now, perhaps one of the most valuable messages that I have taken back with me from the duck is to reflect on how I'm leading my life. Yeah. Is our life just for our own consumption and enjoyment alone? Or do we see a deeper meaning in our life? So this is a question that we need to ask ourselves. How about using some of our energy, some of our resources and love to help other people to improve their lives? Is this something that we can do? Because with every passing day, our life is shorter by 24 hours, right? Every passing day. And during this short human life, can we live a life that can make a difference? It's something for us to reflect. And Venerable Sangasena has led a life uh, with true significance by dedicating himself to improve the lives of impoverished and disadvantaged Ladakis. Even if you think that you're not like Raman Sangasena, you can still make the difference by giving your support. Like the way Sister Ramona has given for the water project. Brother Jerry Ong, who has contributed for the purchase of a bus. Sister Shirley Yo, who has sponsored uh, an, an elderly woman. And uh, Richard C, who has sponsored a child at MRMC. So you can make a difference by giving support. Maybe you like to do the same also, so that you can put your kindness and compassion into action. Yeah. So I've also given my email address just in case some of you express interest to join uh, some future trips in Ladakh. 
or you, maybe you'd like to give some sponsorship okay so uh, this is my presentation but i have uh, allocated a little bit of time uh to to brother charlie dato uh, charlie chia who will speak about the child sponsorship program he's here now and uh, that's why charlie really loves Ladakh. it is like his home you know like his second home like his village Kampo. and he will also celebrate his birthday in Ladakh. and you see he's dressed like a Ladakhi tauke of some sort <laughs> he's such a strong support for mimc sometimes i call him the patron saint of Ladakh. yeah so uh dato charlie can we have you uh, just sharing something about the uh, sponsored child sponsorship, just in case there are people here listening who might want to sponsor a child. Some of you might have already sponsored a child already, but just for the information of others, you know, for the two years and two and a half years with the lockdown, we were not able to organize any trips uh, to Ladakh. And so uh, Ladakh is uh, now doesn't have the benefit of of getting the sponsorship and it is tough running such a big camper to 250 acres and all that eh? so whatever helps that could come in terms of sponsorship uh or in terms of contribution will actually help uh venerable sangas you can actually see his work it's really quite amazing i was so touched and so amazed by his work and that is why i always try to bring groups over there and also to, going back to going to Lada is like going back to my kampong huh? Dr. Charlie <laughs> okay Dr. Charlie <laughs> you can take hi, over everyone. Uh, okay hi everyone I think I believe you all enjoyed the slack show and also full of information uh, regarding this very uh, exotic and uh, inspiring place called Mahabodhi International Meditation Center in Ladakh and uh, you notice that the children, and as well as also the children for the blind, and also the uh, elderly and the monks and the nuns, uh, in order to support them in their education as well as also in their daily lives, uh, there is actually what we call a sponsorship program. And uh, this sponsorship program actually is priced uh, if the children has what you call uh, do not require any lodging at all. That means they stay in their home, especially in Timiskang or Bokarbu. Then it's actually USD uh, 300. And if uh, at the moment now in uh, uh, Timiskang as well as also Bokarbu, they also have uh, hostel facilities now. It's been completed. And the students can also stay in the hostel because they could come from very far reaches of uh, Ladakh and uh, coming into the branch school to study. So then they will require 400 US uh, in order to stay in the hostel. So 300 for education and 400 for boarding. But uh, there are some uh, sponsors who say only I sponsor only the uh, uh, education and uh, the other sponsor will sponsor the uh, uh, boarding. So you can either do either of this or you want to sponsor the whole, uh, what you call education and boarding, including food, then it will be 700 US. And uh, I will be able to uh, post uh, some addresses uh, in the chat and also uh, to a certain extent uh, my email address. And if you wish to sponsor a child, we will be able to send uh, the profile of the students because you may not have a chance to meet up with them. And uh, at the same time, uh, you probably just want to see the pictures and uh, where do they come from and so on. And then you say, okay, I would like to sponsor this child. And uh, we will set the motion where we will send you the forms, you fill it up, and then eventually you send it back to us. And uh, each year, the child will write a letter to all the sponsors to report on their progress, as well as also the Mahabodhi school itself. They will also write another letter to let you know what are their report cards and also some of the extracurricular activities that they are involved in. And at the same time, as they progress from year to year, sometimes they may actually ex, uh, sort of go into the secondary schools or they may go into college and you would like to continue to sponsor. Then, of course, the sponsorship office will then continue to advise you how much will be the uh, sponsor's uh, sheet payments to be made. And... Uh, the money can be easily transferred by uh, in US dollars to the state of India bank under the Mahabodhi uh, International Meditation Center bank account. 
And for those who are few who are in Malaysia, and actually you can uh, remit the in Ringgit Malaysia according to the latest rates, and uh, to me, who will then pull up together all the uh, the donations as well as sponsorship payments, and then we will send it in one lump sum over to uh, uh, MIMC itself. So there are many ways to actually uh, do some sponsorship. And I believe many of our participants in this uh, presentation are also sponsors. And uh, I would just like to show you some pictures of our sponsors. Basically, uh, this, this is actually part of what we call the Compassion in Action uh, uh, sponsorship, which is transforming lives in the Himalayas where children like what uh, Dato Victor has said, that uh, they are from a very poor background. And uh, some of them probably may not have a chance for education. They may be in the nomadic tribes and they'll be wandering around, staying in tents. And as you can see, some of the children who are so uh, dirty and uh, unclean, then they are brought to the school, uh, down to Le or one of the branch schools, and subsequently being transformed. And uh, we are actually very happy to say that uh, quite a number of the students who were brought in during the 1990s, they are actually uh, successful in their life. They have graduated. Some of them are doctors. There is also, uh, like what Dr. Victor says, a, a student with PhD. And uh, they have actually came back to the Mahabodhi organizations to help out in the hospitals as well as also in the schools as teachers. And one of them actually is now the principal of the Mahabodhi Residential School in Leh itself. So when, uh, when the sponsors get the chance to visit uh, the Mahabodhi centers and also the schools, then uh, that is when the student will then be brought uh, to their sponsored parents and uh, the child will be then staying together for uh, the duration of the day and they can will be chatting with each other, talk about their future, and uh, these are some of the sponsors who have uh, made the trips and met up with their sponsored child, right? And uh, these are some of the uh, uh, details where if you are in, uh, keen to sponsor one of the child, then you can actually write to Mahabodhi International Meditation Center or you can send an email to me. And at the same time, we will allocate the child to you. And if the child has uh, left the school, then you say that you would like to sponsor a new one. We can continue a renewal for you. And each year itself, there will be a renewal notice, uh, which will then let you know when to pay, how to pay, and uh, how to send your transfer uh, to the Mahabodhi International Meditation Center account. So like what we all know that, uh, you know, Bante started with only a, a total of about 10 children. And uh, most of these children that you see in these pictures are already very successful. And they are also mothers, already as mothers with a few children. And we can say that Baramur Sangasena is now the grandfather monk. Right? And uh, you can see some of these are the hostels. So if they are what they call sponsored for their boarding, then the students will then stay in this hostel, which has some of the best facilities. And... Uh, the, the students enjoying themselves, have a good time, have a good life, and hopefully have a, a good future. Right? And uh, meals are always uh, uh, on time. And just before they take their meal, there will be a prayer. And they will always reflect uh, their prayers for their sponsors. And it's good that uh, they learn to be grateful. And at the same time, some of these students uh, will get a chance to visit the home country of their sponsors too. So you may want to sponsor them over for a visit or there is one particular sponsor who have actually brought one of the child to Malaysia to study in the, what they call tertiary education. And you can see some of them have actually uh, graduated from the school in Mahabodhi and then eventually move on to places like Bangalore, Delhi, Chandika in order to study. And uh, this is the first the, the batch of girls who are following behind the Bante, they all graduated. And some of them are doctors, dentists. One of the two or three of them are teachers. And one or two have come back to actually help up in my body as uh, officers or executive officers. This is a boys' hostel. 
It's also another good complex, and you notice that uh, they are all provided with solar panels, which provide the power as well as also the hot water system. And uh, at the same time, not only do you sponsor uh, lay boys or girls, you can also sponsor the uh, nuns, right? And then this is a nunnery where the little nuns will then be uh, educated. At the same time, uh, they can also choose to continue to be nuns or they can actually go out to work with their secular education. There is also another monastery. We call it the Mahabodhi Jatavana Monastery. And the uh, children there are ed educated both in the secular as well as in the monastic. So they have a good chance to learn both. And then uh, the decision is theirs later on in their life. As uh, Dr. Victor mentioned, that there is actually an uh, age home. And uh, the happiest people actually on the campus is actually the elderly. They, they was very grateful to the Bante for bringing them in because otherwise in Ladakh, uh, most of the parents or grandparents, uh, they are actually left roaming around and uh, they have actually been not well taken care of. And it is it's a place where they could grow old gracefully and uh, they are all very happy. And uh, because they are in the midst of a little children, they actually had a very, what they call, balanced uh, life. And uh, the other one I think uh, Dr. Victor didn't mention was actually a school for the blind, for the uh, visually impaired. And uh, this school was started with a uh, few children. They, some of them have actually graduated, right? And uh, they have gone, because of their braille, they are able to actually serve in administrative post. And uh, one of them became a teacher. So this is the school. And uh, it's a residential school. You have education. You also have buses. And I think uh, Dr. Victor has also mentioned that some of these buses are sponsored by Malaysians. And they are fetched from the village around the school. And they are brought to the school itself. And most of the students actually excel very well. They did very well in the uh, education system in India itself. This is a Mahabodhi branch school in uh, Timuskan, right? And uh, most of the children actually uh, in this school, in the, especially the branch school, they are sponsored. In Leh, a certain percentage of it is actually paid for by their parents. So with that, thank you very much. And uh, if you are keen, uh, feel free to contact me and then uh, we will then be able to share you more information. Thank you.